Good morning, everybody. I hope you are enjoying this beautiful Thursday and we appreciate you taking some time out of this beautiful day to join us uh, for this very important webinar on some best practices and things for the hospitality industry to know and implement as they look to bring their business back online and re-engage uh, with their clients and customers. Uh, joining me today is Linda Vale with the Ingham County Health Department. Dr. Anike Shoyinka from the Ingham County Health Department, and Julie Pinkston from the Greater Lansing Convention and Visitors Bureau. Uh, the program, the format today, uh, we're going to be having uh, two short presentations from the Ingham County Health Department and then from the uh, GLCVB. Uh, we will then come together back as a group and do some Q&A. Um, at the bottom of your screen, you will have a couple options to submit some questions. There's a Q&A function and a chat function. Those will be monitored, so as we go through the presentation, please feel free to uh, input questions um, or comments into the um, two avenues and we'll make sure to follow up with you at the end of the presentation. Uh, this is part of our uh, relaunch program. Uh, the chamber has worked very closely with a number of business and community leaders on the relaunch uh, Greater Lansing Task Force of which uh, many of the folks today uh, on the panel are participating in. Uh, there's a variety of resources and previous webinars uh, related to reopening and re-engaging the, the business community on the Chamber website. So I encourage you also to visit uh, LansingChamber.org for additional resources. Uh, at this time, we will turn it over to Linda and Dr. Shoinka, and we'll let you guys take the presentation. They will be sharing their screen. Julie and I will be hiding our videos, um, and then we'll be, uh, again, joining you later. So Linda, please take it away. Thank you. I am going to share our screen. There we go. Okay, so, um, you know, we had some, definitely some issues that went on after the opening of bars and restaurants. Um, and then, you know, we saw the governor close down essentially some bars. Um, as a result of activity going across the state. We thought it would be helpful to reach out um, and try to prevent some things like that from happening in the future. So we reached out to the chamber as uh, an outbreak uh, associated to a local restaurant bar was happening and see if we could push out some information that would be helpful to all of you. Next slide. So basically, if we look at what's going on in the United States with regards to cases, we have seen basically, you know, a little bit of a dip down to attempt to flatten that curve, which is going right back up. Um, so we haven't seen, if we look at the entire nation, that much of an impact. Next slide. In Michigan, we actually did a really great job for a while. You know, the governor will be on at 1130, announcing probably that the state is back in medium, medium risk um, for coronavirus transmission, because that's what happened nationwide. But really, if you look at what we did in the state of Michigan, it was remarkable. Next slide. This is what's happening in the state of Florida. So how about we not be like Florida? Um, as you know, they opened bars and restaurants in Florida, then they closed restaurants and bars in Florida. And this is why when you have nearly, you know, over 10,000 new cases in a day, uh, that's a problem. And it basically eclipses their previous peaks because there's so many. Next slide. So this is Ingham County. And I've put arrows on here for you. Our incidence curve, whoops, go back one. All right. Oh, there we go. So here's an arrow that roughly as much as I could get PowerPoint to work for me shows when bars and restaurants opened. Now, on average, the incubation period for uh, COVID-19 is about five and a half days. But then when people become symptomatic, they have to get tested. We have to wait for test results to come back. So push that out a little bit, six to 12 days incubation period. And so the bracket up there shows you what happened in the six to 12 days after we opened bars and restaurants. Next slide. If we look at that in our rolling averages where we also see percent positive tests per day, so sometimes we can see an increase in cases per day, but that might be an increase in testing. So we'll get, we will have more positive cases if we do increase our testing capacity. So we track the number of positive tests per day out of the total tested per day. And you can see again, 
that six to 12 day incubation period lies right with that peak in the number of cases on a rolling average, as well as that peak in new percent positives or increase in percent positives per day, per day following basically six to 12 days after the opening of bars and restaurants here in Ingham County. Next slide. And then just another graph that basically shows you we were plateauing here and then we started back up on an upswing in cases. If you look at these graphs from Florida, it's just a, a logarithmic curve going up. So next slide. The other thing we did was we saw a shift. We did have about 15% of our cases across all of our age groups, 20 to 29, right through 50 to 59. And now our 20 to 29 year old age group is 30% of our cases, which is twice any of our other age groups. So we are seeing young people in bars and restaurants um, basically eclipsing and, and you know, exceeding the, the case counts in every other age group at this point in time, which puts other age groups now at risk for transmission or secondary infection from them. Next slide. And this is where we go to Nikkei. Yeah, thank you, Linda. So um, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me well? Linda, can you hear me clearly? I can. Okay, good. Um, so I'm sure that these um, infographics that everyone is seeing um, and what it says is not unfamiliar to anyone looking at these. Um, you know, it says stay six feet apart, wear a mask in public, wash your hands and clean your surfaces. These are all um, me methods, measures that we are, you know, promoting to prevent um, COVID-19 or the spread of COVID-19. And I just wanted to emphasize here that with the numbers that we're seeing, just as Linda has um, demonstrated with our graphs and all, that um, these measures truly work when we implement them. Now, one of them will not work in isolation to give you a maximal effect but all of them together, staying six feet apart, which prevents exposure, direct exposure to respiratory droplets, with, which I'll be explaining a little bit more. Um, wearing your mask in public, I will definitely be talking a little bit about that too. Washing your hands because when there's exposure to that, um, to those respiratory droplets, depending on where your hands go, what you touch, um, and who you've been exposed to is very important. So washing hands with soap and water, and when that is not available, um, a hand sanitizer that has at least 60% of alcohol is critical. Um, and then definitely within the uh, scope of what everyone here does, um, hospitality, cleaning surfaces after um, there have been, you know, the, those congregate settings um, is important. Like I said before, because of what we do, the only other method that can prevent um, a lot of infection or a lot of spread of disease is um, if everyone stays home and nobody talks to each other and we're past that stage. By virtue of what the hospitality industry does, we are going to have people who are going to come together to do um, multiple things. And so these are the things that are critical to um, make sure that we reduce um, transmission. And so all of them together, like I said, work in layers. I really do, however, want to hone in on wearing masks. And the question is why? So like I said before, respiratory droplets are how COVID-19 is spread. Um, the virus itself is really tiny, but it's carried inside a droplet of um, respiratory fluid, which could be saliva or um, nasal secretions. And so when that happens, um, this, that's how it's spread and it's, you know, moves across a room or what have you. And I'll demonstrate that here. So looking at this, when you wear your mask, it reduces that droplet spread because when anyone sneezes, coughs, or does anything, it projects the droplets across the room to a certain distance. We all talk about the six foot distance. It could be a little less, it could be a little more, depending on who, how fast, um, 
uh, who, what happened. If it's speaking, singing, I'm sure we've all heard about the things in the news as to what singing can do or shouting and what have you. If you look here at, these, um, at this infographic that I have here, oops, excuse me, um, you will see that people who wear masks will still will be exposed, but the duration, how long you stay exposed will determine how much volume of virus you're able to inhale with each um, exposure, so to speak. So the longer you are exposed to someone who is not wearing a mask, who is infected, the, the higher the chances of infection. The CDC uses um, about 15 to 30 minutes to determine what is um, deemed as a significant exposure, you know, low, medium, and high. And of course, anything more than 30 minutes is definitely um, a significant or a high level of exposure. If someone is wearing a mask, on the other hand, there is some exposure. But as you can see, because that person here is wearing a mask, the amount of droplets that are able to move across the room are a lot, are a lot lower. Um, there are two ways to prevent um, transmission generally. And one of them is one, limiting, um, limiting the contact with someone who is infectious, and then two, um, reducing transmission when someone wears a mask. And that's where this um, come from, comes from. I do want to demonstrate what this looks like. <clears throat> As you can see from these pictures, one person is wearing a mask and one person isn't, or the same person is wearing a mask and in the other picture, he's not wearing one at all. And so as we look at this, we will see, where is my, we will see how much happens as he's talking and you know speaking um, compared to the mask. Now, there, it, with the mask, you can see that there isn't as much moving across the room. And so it doesn't have as much velocity, even though some of it is, is moving is moving outside of the mask, but it's around um, the it's around the person. So when you do wear a mask, excuse me, my next slide. Okay. And so when you do wear a mask, so when you do wear a mask, um, you're protecting the person next to you. And so the more people we have that wear masks, the more people um, that are protected. This slide also just demonstrates what happens when people are talking close to each other. And I'll move through this really quickly. As you can see, with normal nose breathing, that's what happens. With mouth breathing, there's a little more movement. As we move along, when someone whistles, as you can see, there's even more. Coughing projects those droplets even further. When you wear a mask, again, it protects significantly. The last thing that I wanted to show you was someone when people talk. As you can see, depending on what you say and how close you are, people will um, spread and share droplets. If any of these two people are infected, then there is a lot of sharing of um, bacteria, of the virus, excuse me. I'm just gonna... So the last thing that I wanted to emphasize here with regards to mask wearing, which I've tried to emphasize significantly, is the fact that not only do masks um, reduce the spread of virus, but this virus is significant in what it does in terms of mortality. This graph that you're looking at here shows um, a comparison of different countries across the world. This study um, looked at about 198 countries and looked at them comparing what um, their policies were and what their cultural norms were with regards to mask wearing. And as you can see that over this period of time from um, about April 16th, there's a big difference in terms of um, the mortality in places where masks are not worn. And so again, as I've emphasized before, part of this um, conversation is that within um, 
the hospitality industry where we have congregate um, settings where people come together, wearing masks is a significant piece to that. And I'm gonna have, um, um, have Linda continue with the rest of this conversation really quickly. So basically, um, we have executive orders in place. 2020-110 is the basic order that is about shutdown. Um, and when we opened up, very little was left shut down. So the, the, the order more speaks to what is closed rather than what is open. It does require people to wear masks in any enclosed public space unless they're medically unable to tolerate it. Let me repeat, it requires that people wear masks in any enclosed public space. What it did not put into place was a penalty or a consequence for that. So as a result, people wear masks or don't wear masks. You as businesses, building owners, your person in charge or whoever who's authorized to act on your behalf are permitted right within the executive order to deny entry or access to anyone who refuses. And you are not subject to any claims of, I don't even know what claim of quiet enjoyment is, frustration of purpose, it's whatever. So that basically is there for you um, to basically rest on and say, I am, you know, I can deny you entry. And there are ways for you to work around that as well. And in case you're wondering about the next phase, when we go to phase five, uh, we, we would anticipate that the language would stay as it is in 2021-15. And all of this exact language remains in that executive order. Next. So the other thing that you all have is 2021-14 safeguards to protect Michigan workers. There is a section one that is for all businesses and it requires things like a plan. And I mean, there are a number of things. So you should look at 2021-14 section one, you probably most of you have, and look at all of the requirements that are there for all businesses. Follow all of the rules also for your sector. So you may be not restaurants and bars, but I'm gonna to refer to section six for restaurants and bars because that's kind of what we were mainly targeting here. So section six has a restaurant and bar section. So others of you that don't fit under bars and restaurants, just ask us which section of executive order 2021-14 you fit into because we can scroll through them real fast and find the pertinent stuff and we can help you. So next slide. Um, when an employee is, um, I think Dr. Sharon, you were going to take this part. Yes. And so this, this is the part where we kind of come in um, with regards to um, supporting um, businesses here. One of the um, important pieces of um, the executive orders is um, reporting a positive case um, within your business. And it does say to immediately notify um, local health departments. In addition, you're supposed to notify your coworkers or anyone who had been um, exposed. And then after that, there were, as part of the executive orders, it does speak to doing cleaning um, within the facility. And there are some directions there. If you check on um, the CDC website, there is a, a list of EPA approved cleaning or disinfecting agents that you can use for deep cleaning, making sure that you clean all your surfaces um, you know, all the high surfaces, especially the high touch surfaces overall. On the health department side, when you do call us to notify us, there are a couple of things that we will be asking from you. One of them would be that we want to know who was exposed um, within the workplace. And we will be helping to determine what exposure looks like. It's not going to be everyone who just walked across, you know, walked into the room and spent two minutes within the location, but we will be able to determine depending on how long, who was wearing a mask, who wasn't, who was symptomatic and what have you. And all that information that we obtain will be helpful for us to complete contact tracing. And so one of my um, major um, pleas to you is that when you do get that call, um, please provide us with that contact information. It is our um, public health duty to um, obtain that information simply for the reason of contact tracing, which is part of what we do to reduce the transmission um, of disease. And then now, Linda, it's on to you again. Yeah. So we just want to wrap up here 
and um, and talk about some of the things you can do. I just got a question in the chat. Do If a guest claims they're medically unable to wear a mask, you have a right to ask for a doctor's note. No, you do not. People's health information is protected and private. If they tell you that they're medically unable, you just have to accept their word for that. So, can what? I Can I answer something to that, Linda, really quick? Sure. I just wanted to say that other alternatives, if this question comes up again, even with regards to staff, who for a medical reason or what have you cannot wear a mask. Another alternative, though not um, solidly um, um, emphasized within the CDC and um, at the state level is wearing a face shield. It does still prevent and help with that droplet spread that I talked so much about in terms of the projection of where it goes. Thank you, that's all I wanted to say. Right, so the face shields are an option, especially with your, your staff. We are encouraging you some important things that you can do that will help you keep you open. We are working really, really hard at the health department to contain outbreaks, to contain the transmission in the community so that we do not have to close again. But we need your help. You are basically at every one of these indoor public places. I have eight staff that do restaurant inspections, the police force, doesn't have the ability to be out at a thousand licensed food facilities within this county, nor do we think that's necessarily appropriate for policing in an environment where we're talking about what is really appropriate for policing. So you are the ones that are out there in every single one of these public indoor locations having a choice to deny entry without masks or to allow entry without masks. And I understand sometimes it's like, well, I'll lose business, but if you unite together, then you won't. Just like when we had the clean air law and a lot of bars and restaurants were like, oh, we'll lose business, people go someplace else. It's like, no, we're gonna level the playing field if we do it all across the state. And so when we, if we can unite in this and deny entry without masks, you all will help keep yourselves open. The rest of what can help you keep yourselves open is to enforce the social distancing above and beyond spacing your table six feet apart send patrons back to their tables make them wear a mask if they come up to the bar and there are people crowded at the bar um, they wear a mask at the hostess stand they wear a mask going <clears throat> to the uh to, to get up and go to the bathroom the only time they can take off their mask is when they are seated at a table which you're already required <clears throat> excuse me to have six feet apart from your other tables if people get up and start trying to drag tables together, you're perfectly accustomed to telling people you can't do that. I've been told in bars, restaurants, no, you can't drag those tables together. So we need you to really work at enforcing that social distancing above and beyond just simply placing your tables six feet apart. One of the things you consider with, you know, the I can't wear a mask, it's like now we can go to outdoor dining. So maybe consider your outdoor dining with limited or no indoor dining or at least, you know, with the no mask wearers, can we get those people to dine outdoors? So at the very least, encourage outdoor dining to the extent that you have it. Um, so can we unite? Can we have some seal of approval like the safe pledge? So the safe pledge is a good idea. Following all of these things and denying entry and enforcing social distancing will help you to stay open knowing your executive orders as well as CDC and OSHA guidelines will keep your staff and your customers safe. And basically I'm gonna turn over to Julie Pinkston right now from the Convention and Visitors Bureau that's done a great job with this uh, safe pledge um, work in our, in our region. And um, we're just hoping that we can get all of you to join us in that safe pledge and in uniting together around these safe practices that will help you keep yourselves open. Thank you, Linda, and I'm happy to join you on this conversation today. And thank you to the Lansing Regional Chamber for putting this event together. You know, it's been a tough time for our hospitality industry and our tourism industry here and across the world. So. Um, I wanted to back up a little bit before I get into the safe pledge information because what has taken us to the journey to get to the safe pledge really shows that our industry, which is focused on visitors to the community in many cases, 
um, the, that they are looking for a safe destination. They're looking for safe businesses. They're looking for safe places to go. So we um, put together the safe pledge based on a lot of, of data and need uh, in the community. So let me see if this is not working. There we go. So we have been following this data. Um, it says on the top of the perceived safety of travel activities, and this is wave 16. Uh, the national company called Destination Analysts have been following this question since March 15th. And this is based on about 12 to 1500 potential travelers. And they show of all the things that are travel related and, and hospitality related of what they feel safe potentially doing and what they feel absolutely not safe doing. So you can see at the top, no one wants to go on a cruise right now. And that's been very consistent this entire time since March 15th, as we can all imagine. It certainly matches what uh, Linda and Nikkei were saying about closed places and being outdoors. A cruise ship does not lend to that very easily. However, at the bottom, many of the things that are that are people do feel a lot more comfortable with are the things that we're able to do at this time. And it is, you know, outdoor recreation, staying in a hotel, going shopping, dining in a restaurant. But the, the negative perception is still higher than anyone would like it to be. We're, we have seen it gone down considerably and this graph has shifted over time. But this is the, this is the data that I look at quite frequently because it just shows that people that when they want to travel, when we're able to travel, that safety is going to be an ongoing concern and something that's going to be a focus for us for a very long time. So I have uh, been partnering in many ways um, with the US Travel Association. They've worked nationally with all of the major hospitality and tourism related uh, associations such as the American Hotel and Lodging Association, the National Restaurant Association, the Motor Coach Carriers Association, probably there's 30 associations that are involved in putting together best practices and, and a way to travel confidently is their message right now. So I'm going to try to show this video. I hope it works. <laughs> and um, show where the, some of the messaging is going to, to start coming out nationally and what we're going to do locally. So as you can see, a lot of work has gone into um, making a campaign related to safety. That's how important our industry feels that uh, this information is at this time. So as I said, this uh, is a campaign that is, is happening nationally and something that we are partnering in with as well here locally, uh, starting with some of the simple messaging. And then as more people are able to travel and, and come to our hospitality related businesses that that we will ramp up uh, some of that messaging as well. So something I would point everyone to is um, also through US Travel Association and the work that they've done is the um, toolkit that they have put together called Travel in the New Normal. And this toolkit, the, the link is there at the bottom. And it's a, it's a very simple uh, toolkit, but with lots of links and resources to point you into best practices and how to implement you implement those for your particular business. And um, that is something that is also being done nationally. 
and one of the things that that was part of it and part of the conversation was communities offering some sort of safe pledge and that our businesses are focused on doing those right best practices. So here in the region, we created the Greater Lansing Safe Pledge here at the Convention and Visitors Bureau. And it is for the entire region, which um, our partners from Ingham County um, represent that county, but we represent Eaton and Clinton as well. So this is available to all. And the Safe Pledge, we've just started now pushing out to get people to sign up for. It's a very simple process if you're a business focused on everything that Linda mentioned just a few moments ago of keeping your business open and keeping all the best practices in place for your guests. So we've had about 50 sign up so far. We focused first from our perspective on our hotel partners. So many of them have uh, signed on to the pledge. Uh, but now we're pushing into restaurants and other retail locations and just any other businesses. We've uh, had golf course sign up other locations that are interested in showing and showcasing that they are committed to doing the right things for the community and for visitors. So this has been on our website for a, a, a few weeks now and it is now becoming the most clicked on section of our website. So if you go to lansing.org, it's right on the homepage. You can scroll down like two clicks and it's right there for everyone to either view it or uh, sign up for it. Or please reach out to me if you're interested in that. The, what the pledge encompasses is uh, some some very simple things. Basically everything that, that the Health, Ingham County Health Department just presented that should be done, that's what businesses are pledging to do. So it's requiring face masks at businesses, having a policy and procedure of how you're going to run your business related to any kind of COVID or other uh, uh, protocols that needed to be implemented at this time. It also, um, we put something at the end that I thought, you know, brought it right back home to hospitality was that we will still always provide a warm yet physically distanced welcome to our guests. And so that is uh, the most important thing that it, it has difficult in times when there are arguments over masks or there are people that don't want to follow every rule, but we are still the hospitality industry and how do we do this and how do we do this warmly and welcoming and still shine the best light on our community. So the pledge, um, I encourage everyone to participate. I'm happy to answer further questions on it individually um, if you have uh, thoughts uh, about it. And what we've been doing then is taking that lo hashtag Love Lansing logo that was created uh, and this whole, actually this whole um, screenshot here is um, we, we provide a PDF that then you can post. I've had a hotelier or two that have um, put it on the tagline of their email message um, when they send an email, it says the na their name, the name of their hotel, and then this, this logo at the bottom to just really keep emphasizing to our guests and to the hospitality industry that we are a destination that wants to be safe, that wants to provide the best experience possible for everyone that comes here. And so obviously for us, we're very focused on visitors. And as I said, that's not happening as much as we'd like right now, but um, a lot of uh, residents uh, look at our information. This is very important to them as well. So um, I think that even in the short term, this is an important step for all of our businesses to take just to get that message out and when we'll keep pushing the safe pledge and the information that it shares. So to, to conclude a little bit, um, this, this information from U.S. Travel for Traveling Confidently shows that the traveler's journey is not a one stop. You know, they are having a lot of touch points as they move throughout our community. And it involves then all of us working together to really put forth the best and most safe process that a visitor can experience, that a resident can experience. We all, you know, connect together, connect with each other. And that's where we need to focus uh, as, a, as a destination and as a group uh, in our community. So to conclude, um, this is my favorite graphic because it shows we can still enjoy outside. We can still have a barbecue. So physically distanced yet masked up, but it can still happen as long as we do the right things and um, work together as a destination to make that happen. I think that yesterday, Linda and I were on a call together and one of the most exciting things that she encouraged us to do as an industry was, I think we've all heard about social distancing, social distancing. 
well, our industry, the hospitality industry is not anything for social distancing <laughs> in normal times. So she encouraged us to call it physical distancing. And uh, I think that's a trend that others are now adopting. I've heard it just in the last day of a few others now saying physically distanced rather than socially distanced, which really matches what we do as an industry in hospitality, especially in this community. So I will turn it back um, to, to Michelle, I think for questions or any comments that we, all three of us may answer and, and provide more information on and or have a discussion about uh, what's next. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julie, and uh, appreciate all the information that you guys have shared. Um, Julie, if you maybe want to, there you go, stop sharing your screen and bring, uh, bring us all back here. Um, I've been kind of monitoring the chat, making some notes, and I got a couple questions that I just want to kick back to the group. Um, Linda, you had mentioned kind of the, the safe return to work plan and, and businesses having that return to work plan. Um, what elements should be in place when you look at that safe return to work plan? Well, there should be a screening, so employee screening. Um, there should be plans around how you're going to do your cleaning and enhance sanitation. There should be some plans in there with regard to your employees. Keep in mind, while you are allowed to deny entry to, part, to patrons who come in, but you don't have to, your employees are required to wear masks. So training employees in terms of what that plan has in it. Those are some of the key things that I can, can think of that are required in, in a return to work plan. Um, and anybody, of course, at any time can, can uh, chime in and, and add on, on to any of these questions or comments as well. Um, you know, you had, had Matt, the question had come up about um, the doctor's note piece and whether or not you can request that. And you had kind of spoke to that, you know, what are maybe some best practices in, in some of kind of that PR about dealing with, with a customer who does not want to wear a mask um, or is, is not following those rules? I mean, it, this is a very difficult time for businesses. They, they need, um, you know, the, the revenue piece and whatnot. So how, how can they continue to be a good, um, you know, a good consumer? Right. So, you know, we've seen some escalation of situations regarding mask wearing on both sides. I mean, honestly, I've seen people get angry at people in places for refusing to wear masks. And I've seen angry people for being told they have to wear masks. So both sides of that tend to get a little hostile and a little angry. Um, I think we de-escalate de that situation when we unite and it becomes the norm. When it becomes the norm, we de-escalate some of that, you know, just resistance and hostility and things like that. So the more we can come together and as a community, just across the board be that way, the more it's like, well, there's nothing to fight about anymore because this is just the new normal. So we have to help people get to the new normal. Um, some of the things you can do, you know, as businesses, you know, you've got, you know, uh, swag, you know, get some masks that have your logo on them, offer them at your door to people. It now becomes a promotional item. I keep telling people I was at Firekeepers Casino, which I only went to because I ate there. I really, I did. Um, but, you know, I have a mask that has a Firekeepers Casino logo on it now. So, you know, th there's a way to make it something that promotes your business as well. That's a great suggestion. Um, I think that's something that businesses can really rally behind. Um, there was a question about houses of worship and um, the what part of the executive order they fall under. They are exempt. So okay. you will find in Executive Order 110 that there's nothing in 110 that basically um, interferes with a religious organization's ability to do, kind of do their thing. So then you don't find guidance within the other executive orders about what they have to do once they open, other than, you know, the, I would follow the all business thing. What you can do is find some good guidelines on the CDC website. So CDC will have specific guidelines for different sectors and they will have a guideline for places of worship and religious institutions. So we'd be happy to find those um, guidelines for you, get them to, um, to Michelle and then uh, basically she can send them out to the list of folks here. And I was gonna say, we can also get those PowerPoints out so you can watch those full, full videos. I'm a science geek, so I like to watch the whole thing. We had to kind of shoot through it real fast because you would have gotten bored, but 
we can send those out so you can watch that and you can get a little bit more detail on seeing how those masks really do impact the travel of airflow. Yep. Are there any PDFs or signage made available to, to put up? Um, signage that indicates, you know, mask mandates or social uh, physically distancing, um, are, are those available? Yes, they are. I'm gonna get you a link from our website. You can Perfect. feel free to take these. They are in printer friendly versions. We have a whole um, group of printer friendly fact sheets and signage. Um, they are yours to use. And um, you can, you know, go to your printers and put them in whatever size you need. There's a number of different ones there. Some of them have multiple languages. Um, it's everything from hand washing to, it does say social distance because in the public health world, that's kind of what we stuck with. Um, but I think from a hospitality side and even in the public health world, we, want, we don't want people to socially disconnect. We need you to physically be separated. Mm -hmm. So we tried to kind of shift our language on that, but we were a little, a little too far into the social distance messaging to, to really flip that. But I do encourage it within the hospitality industry. So there's a, there's a fairly extensive list of fact sheets, um, flyers, signage that you can use anywhere. Perfect. You know, Julie, I know you had mentioned that the Safe Pledge kind of started with, with uh, the businesses rooted in the hospitality industry, but you did mention that it is more, it is expanding out for professional services and, and other businesses throughout the community. Yes, that's right. You know, I think we promote as a destination. So if the more that are involved in, in the Safe Pledge really does show that as a destination, we're working together and a full community, it's not just, um, you know, I think ac actually someone from the chamber signed you guys up so you are not necessarily hospitality based but you're committed to this region and having it move forward in a safe and proactive way so we, we encourage all businesses to do that and as i mentioned we do have the then the safe pledge that can be put on your website uh, that link uh the, the information the chamber also has done that and that is helpful to have everybody see that and have that consistent message and then when people do start to come back that then maybe that's also a pdf or a graphic that's placed in a business window or at the, at the checkout counter or the check-in counter for hotels, uh, whatever the case may be. And we're hopeful then as we go along that that is something we can provide in a actual printed sign format and rather than print it on a piece of paper at this time uh, as we move along and more people can, can display that and have it, have it be a consistent message throughout the community. And I think that's great. The, the suggestion of putting it in your, um, in your email signature, I think is, is brilliant is it, to start to build some awareness and um, weight within the campaign. I think that's great. Um, and actually, Michelle, I wanted to say, I guess in the chat, uh, my video did not play. It was playing beautifully for me. So I'm really sorry it did not play for you. I put that link in. It's on ustravel.org and you can watch it. It's about I hope you enjoyed the music. It was nice jazzy music, but it sounded video, really good. <laughs> the video had some um, very nice messaging related to the steps you take that Linda outlined of social di physical distancing, wearing masks, but it showed it in a in a actual people traveling, showing their phone as they checked in at a touchless uh, checkpoint to, to do virtual check in. And it also um, comes with a toolkit that you can look at ustravel.org and it shows some signage and some PDFs that you can download to then have the kind of hospitality tourism related mm -hmm. graphics as well, like the last one I showed with the barbecue and things like that. Those are available um, on ustravel.org. It's great. Uh, I, it, did, uh, okay. I did post the CDC guidance, both to the person who asked the question about religious organizations as well as in the chat. And then Perfect. I do see that we have somebody here that asks about feeling sick and can you require that they be tested before they come back to work. You're an employer. You can, but we really prefer either a time or a symptom based strategy for returning people to work. So that means basically you have symptoms, you don't work. If your symptom onset, um, basically, let me start that again. If your symptoms last just a short period of time, we want you to stay home for 10 days, no matter how long you have symptoms. Then we want you, if you have symptoms for say up to seven or eight days, we want you to remain home for 72 hours past the, the, the basically your symptoms going away and the resolution of fever. So you might have a little bit of a, you know, a niggly cough or something like that, but if that fever's down, right, that's important. So 
really, and your public health workers, if somebody is COVID positive, our public health staff are guiding them as to when they can come out of isolation and return to work safely. So I do see some places it's like, oh, you're out of work sick and I want you COVID tested before you come back. A COVID test that says oh, somebody's negative, it means they're negative today. That's all, that's all it means is today. Linda, what, is, what does that process look like should an employee or um, a patron test positive for um, COVID-19 in your, in your facility? What, what does that process look like for the, for the business? I'm going to let Dr. Sherinka take that. Beautiful. <laughs> oh, okay, so um, when you do have, and that has happened a lot recently, but when you do have a positive case, like I said earlier in the presentation, one of the things we want to know is we want to be contacted at the health department because the health department can help in guiding what that process should look like. The number one thing is that that positive person should be asked to go home. Um, they cannot stay in the place of business. And then the next thing would be to call us to figure out so that we can figure out who was exposed and what exactly exposure looks like. The questions we'll be asking is, does this person have symptoms? If they do have symptoms, when did the symptoms start? We will then take two, we will now look at exposure from two days prior to when symptoms started, and we will find out if that person has been at work throughout that period, we will now have to figure out how his, co he, his or her coworkers were exposed. Was everyone wearing a mask? Were they all, you know, is it a place where everybody couldn't be um, six feet apart? You know, is there good ventilation or where was everybody working outside? And so all those factors we will put together to determine who those contacts are. That person who is sick, who has been confirmed as positive, as Linda said, depending if they're asymptomatic, we would say you need to stay home for 10 days and then after that you can return to work. Um, if they're symptomatic, then as Linda explained, we want you to have been symptom free for at least 72 hours plus the 10 days or including the 10 days um, from the first day of onset of symptoms or the first day of your test. And like I said, this is a lot to put together right here. We will work through that with you if necessary. But that contact from you when you get an employee that tests positive, and keep in mind, an employee could be sick with a sore throat or a runny nose and it could not be COVID. And you need to use your regular policies around employees working sick. We don't want employees working sick for any Right. You know, any illness that they might have that produces fever and that sort of thing. So, you know, if their medical provider sends them in for a COVID test because that medical provider determines, you know what, you should get tested, then you'll get a COVID test. But your employee might be sick for some totally other reason. Let their medical provider determine that they need to go get a COVID test, not you. Okay? So encourage them to consult with their medical provider if that person wants a COVID test because of their you know, discernment of, of symptomology, then that's when a COVID test is appropriate. So let that doctor then help guide you when somebody comes back to work, no matter what illness it is. And if it's a COVID test that turns positive, we will help you with that. Um, and I was gonna add something going to what Nikkei was saying, but I forgot, oh, I know what it is. So when we get notification of a positive test, we don't have a place of work that is associated with it, right? We have a name, we have a phone number, we have a date of birth probably. We have that just medical information and a COVID positive test. So until we get a hold of a person and another person that have been exposed at the same place of work, we don't connect those two cases together. So either you getting a hold of us or us putting two cases together is the only way we'll know that there's a workplace exposure. So. That is why it's important for you to reach out to us if you get notified that you have an employee that's COVID positive, because that speeds up our ability to connect potentially cases together that are the result of the same workplace and then shut down that transmission. And again, contain things quickly, let you clean up quickly and let you get back open. Yeah, that's a great reminder that we really are all in this together and we're only gonna get out of it in that way too. Um, 
at this time, I don't have any additional questions. So if, if anybody has any lingering questions out there that they wanted to, to sneak in before the 11 o'clock hour, go ahead and, and throw them in the Q&A or the chat box. Uh, but I'll give each of you kind of a, you know, last couple minutes to, to give us kind of your, your final thoughts and um, see if we get any additional questions before we wrap up here at 11. And we'll start with Linda, since you are left on my Brady Bunch screen. Well, you know, you, you reminded me of something that I saw tweeted not long ago. Uh -oh. And so I'm going to read it for you. So uh, tweeted, it doesn't matter by whom. Okay, I have a question. How did the movie Groundhog Day finally shift to the next day for Bill Murray? Have we tried that yet? <laughs> so the person replies back, he breaks the cycle when he shifts his focus from himself to devoting himself to helping others. And yes, that's exactly how we get out of this, all of this. So uh, we need your help. You know, you are the people that are letting people in to indoor public places. And if you can adhere to these rules, if you can make your patrons adhere to these rules, find creative ways, logos, swag, things like that, that help, it's like, here's a mask. I, you know, I, as a retailer, I'm going to come offer you curbside service if you can't medically tolerate a mask. Oh, you want to buy, I don't know what, and I've got eight different options in my store. Let me bring them all out to you so you can see them. And then I'll help you that way. And that way we allow the person to be part of your business. We provide top-notch customer service by literally bringing out options outside to them while you're wearing a mask and keeping yourself safe outside now with that six foot distancing to the extent that you can. And then um, we all kind of move forward together. So you've got lots of creative options to deny people entry while still providing customer service. And keep in mind, you know, we get concerned about those folks that can't medically tolerate a mask. Sort of like herd immunity with vaccinations, right? So when we, when we vaccinate, we know there are a certain number of children that cannot medically get a vaccine. They might have had childhood leukemia or have other reasons where a vaccine is just not something that they can have. And that makes them very vulnerable. So we vaccinate around them to protect them. And depending on the illness that requires, you know, 80% herd immunity, measles is a really high one. Masks are the same way. If we can get to where 70 or 80% of people are wearing masks, then we protect enough people that we protect others. So we have a little bit of wiggle room for those people who can't medically tolerate a mask to still be able to come in if everybody else is wearing them. So if we can get up to like that 80%, we could get ourselves to a point where when the second wave comes in the fall, that it's not a huge wave, it's just a little blip and we keep moving right on through it. So listen to science and help us. Another great reminder, and I do believe that Bill Murray could save the world, so thank you for that quote as well. <laughs> uh, Anike, if you'd like to maybe uh, add, and then we'll, we'll wrap up with Julie, and we'll, we'll say goodbye to everybody this morning. Um, yeah, first of all, thank you very much for, you know, having us here to um, share that information and to connect with everyone again. Um, it's really important, like Linda said, that we all work together. The other thing that we that requires togetherness, like I mentioned in my slides, was all those methods that we're supposed to do. So everything works together. Everything kind of adds up. So if we just wear a mask, but we are not keeping the mask clean and not doing hand hygiene, then it doesn't work as well. If we're just doing social distancing or physical distancing, like we're we're you know, kind of correcting that um, statement to make it sound um, better, but we're not doing hand hygiene and not doing masks, then it may not work that well because we can't really all the time be physically distant um, from everyone. And so I like to see it as a layered thing. The only way the water is not gonna seep through the bottom is if we use everything. If we have just one layer, it's not gonna stay. So if we employ everything, we'll do a whole lot better. Um, it's a cumulative effect. Sure, we have the tools. Let's make sure we're using them. Right. And Julie, bring us on home this morning. Well, I don't know how I can top what these <laughs> experts in the field have stated. It's all about coming together and working together. And I think that's the message that we all carry forward. Um, I think that 
in normal times, I have probably met Linda Vale mm, two or three times over time. And it has been a blessing to have her leading um, our charge here locally because I have learned so much. And, and now with Nike, I get to know you a little bit better. We are in very good hands in our county health department. And, and I know others as well, other than the two just here. But they have really been fighting for hospitality businesses to stay open, to do the right things. Nobody wants to have Linda on CNN again. So, <laughs> except maybe Linda, but I'm not sure. But, no, no, really. It's but okay. She got to be on CNN because of, of the incident that we had here. It was just became a story. And we really, really want our businesses to, to come together, work together, and do all the right best practices. So much so that the safe pledge then is something that we can stand behind and promote as a destination and really stand together on that. Uh, so much so that I didn't mention earlier, but the state of Michigan through Travel Michigan is looking at a Pure Michigan promise for the same kind of pledge for the state of Michigan. So we're already on our way for that. And I think then if the Pure Michigan promise lays over what we've done, we're all going to come out together uh, now as a statewide effort and, and we can't, can't uh, fall back behind and, and, and have our businesses suffer any more than they already have because hospitality has been very, very hit very hard uh, uh, during this whole pandemic and we want our businesses to succeed and, and grow forward as we as we go on. So I thank you for the time and happy to answer any questions. My email is always jpingston at lansing.org. So feel free to reach out and how we can best work with you and promote. Thank you. Just a fantastic examples of leadership from you ladies throughout this pandemic. I mean, just kudos to all of you and everybody um, that's been, you know, revamped and uh, had been thrown back to the drawing board to, to kind of rebuild our, our community. So just phenomenal job. Uh, we are going to send a follow-up email with a, a recording of the presentation, um, a bunch of the links that, that were provided here from the uh, panelists um, and some of those videos. And again, um, you know, please don't hesitate to reach out to any of us should we be of any assistance. And uh, information is found on all of our websites. Um, so please, again, um, enjoy your Thursday. Stay safe, stay cool out there. And uh, thank you for spending this hour with us. Have a good day, guys. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.